following lecture was produced by Gloria and Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. This course that we've been giving about yoga has been based on the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, which are uh, the root scripture of Hatha Yoga, Raja Yoga, and many other traditions. Nowadays, people are not that familiar with the Yoga Sutras, even though yoga is a household name. And people nowadays mistakenly think that yoga is simply about stretching the body or adopting different types of positions with the body and mistakenly assume that those postures will somehow make them spiritual. Of course, anyone who's studied the Yoga Sutras knows that that belief is mistaken. So we're giving this course in order to help people understand what real yoga is, in order to dispel the misconceptions and mistaken beliefs so that people don't waste their time. And in the previous lectures of this course, we've explained the primary schools of yoga, specifically four main ones, because there are many varieties of yoga. The four main ones are karma yoga, which is related with action, and jnana yoga, which is related with the intellect, the mind, with knowledge, and bhakti yoga, which is related with the devotion and the heart and prayer. And all of that is synthesized in what is called Raja Yoga or the Royal Yoga, which is really the path of transformation, of meditation. Now, strictly speaking, these four varieties or four ways of looking at yoga are all the same thing. They can't be separated from each other. But the needs of the person because of our idiosyncrasies and because of the great complexity that we find ourselves within. We sometimes need to focus on one aspect or another in order to strengthen where we are weakest. Until we get those parts of ourselves, the mind, the heart, and the body, in an equilibrium, balance, so that we can then really work with the Raja Yoga, the royal path. So in previous lectures, the first three, we explained those principles and we discussed how those three parts of yoga correspond to our three brains, the intellect, the heart, and the body. But we have not yet dwelt deeply on the heart, so today we will. We're going to talk about the yoga of devotion. Now when we use this word yoga, let us not assume that we're only talking about something that is Hindu or Indian in nature, because it isn't. The word yoga simply means to unite. So when we study yoga, we're really studying mysticism or religion. We're studying the union of our consciousness with something that is fundamentally real. And this is the most striking difference 
between the misconception that people have about yoga and the reality of yoga. The misconception of yoga is that by stretching your body or doing certain types of exercises or postures, that you will somehow come to know God. And the mistake is precisely that one does not know God by adopting a posture. One knows God by knowing how to recognize what the reality of God is, how to realize it, to perceive it, not to believe in it, not to have a theory, but to actually experience that. That is what yoga is. It is that experience. The union of the individual consciousness that is perceiving with its reality. That is the union that we seek. So this image is a painting that illustrates a scene from the Mahabharata. And it represents a symbolic form of how that union is explained in the story of the Mahabharata. How divinity is revealed to the devotee. And you see that word devotee is used a lot in Hinduism. And it means one who is devoted. To have devotion. It doesn't mean one that believes. But someone who has their heart filled with fire. So this is what we have to understand about yoga. It is the union of the devoter the one who's in the state of devotion with the beloved. And in this case, we're talking about God, divinity. The one that is receiving that devotion is, of course, what we call God, what we call the being. But in Hinduism, the main word used for this is Ishvara. And this word has a tremendous significance, but again is often misinterpreted, especially in the West. The term Ishvara literally means to be capable, to have capability. But by interpretation, it means supreme consciousness, God, the God of love. Master, king, even queen, lord, even husband. But perhaps the most interesting meaning is creative source. Ishvara, the source of creation. So the union that the devotee longs for is the union of the consciousness with Ishvara. And that Ishvara is not outside of anything. It is inside of everything. So when a spiritual person is longing to really experience true and genuine spirituality, they are mistaken when they seek outside for that. When they look for masters, when they look for schools or temples, when they look for someone to follow or someone to believe in, someone to save them, they are mistaken. Because the one who saves is inside of every living thing, not outside. The true devotee worships that Ishvara within themselves. They may use an external form or an external symbol, like a cross or a statue or a painting. But the true devotee, who really understands religion or yoga, knows that that external form is a symbol of the reality in all things. So when we look at religion and we study Hinduism or Buddhism or Christianity or Judaism, we perceive all of the believers and followers who worship Jehovah, Jesus, Krishna, Buddha, all of the different gods. 
But the one who really understands yoga knows that all of those worshipers are worshiping the same force, Ishvara. It's just that the worshipers don't realize it because they haven't experienced it yet. That Ishvara is inside of all things. When we study the tree of life and we study Kabbalah, this is illustrated on that map. So if we look at the tree of life, we see that all manifested things emerge from the unmanifested. So at the very top of the tree of life, we see symbolized the absolute. The abstract space. So if we try to imagine that, Imagine it is the very space within which all things are. All things. Not only ourselves, but everything outside of us. All of the people, all of the plants and animals, the whole of the planet, the whole of all of the planets in our region, the whole of the galaxy, the whole of every living and breathing, existing thing is suspended in a given entity or non-entity, a space, a fabric. That is the absolute. And when that unmanifested produces a form, it is still the same unmanifested, but adopting a given appearance. To our perception, we see things, people, places. And we assume that our perception reflects the reality of those things, but in fact, it does not. Because all perceptible things are just ripples on the ocean of the imperceptible. They are like waves on an ocean. When you're very close to that water, the waves seem huge and tremendous and terribly threatening and real or perhaps beautiful. But the further you go into the atmosphere, the more smooth and beautiful and simple that ocean appears. And you get further and further and further and realize there's not just one ocean. There are many other things going on that we couldn't see when we were only focusing very close up on those little waves. The absolute is like that. It is a type of fabric or type of potentiality that gives rise to everything. Now within us, this tree of life exists. It represents many levels of the manifestation of that potentiality. And the lowest here is our physical body and our degenerated mind the impurity that we are afflicted with. Within that, if we learn to look and we learn to perceive past all of the veils of physicality, of energy, of emotion, of thought, of will, of consciousness, of spirit, going deeper and deeper and more and more subtle, we can learn to actually perceive with our individual consciousness that Ishvara, that first expression of the unmanifested, which is inside of us. And the perception of that, the experience of that is yoga, union. It is when the individual consciousness is united with its source. And that produces what we can call an ecstasy. A type of experience that is thrilling to the soul because it's seeing itself, it's seeing its true nature, it's seeing the reality, it's experiencing freedom, liberation, moksha. Being completely liberated from all of its entanglements and pains and bondages. 
That is why the spiritual aspirants are always craving samadhi. It is to have that, even for an instant, to feel that liberation, to feel the truth. So all of that is beautifully shown in the tree of life. Now, Ishvara itself, when we talk about God, or we talk about the being, it is not a person. We think of God, foolishly, as being a person. And people have these different imaginings about their being, or about God the Father as an old man with a beard, or some other form that they've adopted from their traditional religion. But the truth is, what is the difference between the wave and the ocean? Nothing but a brief appearance. Ishvara is a appearance that shows itself to the individual consciousness in different forms in order to aid that consciousness. But in itself, it is not a thing, a person, an individual. It is far beyond that. To understand that is not easy because of our intellect, because of our psychology. The key to understand is this, that Ishvara is pure capability, free, liberated, not bound by anything. It is the ultimate aspect of what we can call the innermost, the being, the spirit. There are many names for this type of uh, concept that we're trying to explain that ultimately isn't conceptual. And unfortunately, over the centuries, as people have tried to understand religions, they have tried to make this Ishvara into something concrete, something that has a, a tangible form that we can grasp onto and believe in. But it isn't like that. The truth of Ishvara is much more abstract and truly much more beautiful than some man up in the clouds like Zeus, who's throwing thunderbolts at us every once in a while. It's not like that. Ishvara is inside of us, inside of everything. Now, I've pointed out here that this term Ishvara can literally be translated as number 11, which seems sort of weird until you realize that in Kabbalah, the number 11 is related to the arcanum of the tarot, 11. And when you know that image, the 11th arcanum, it depicts a very serene woman who is holding open the jaws of a lion. This is Ishvara. This is the capability or the power of Ishvara. The lion represents karma. It represents the force of nature that must answer to the causes that have been produced. In other words, cause and effect. That lion represents that aspect of all things that must respond when a cause happens. An effect always happens. Nevertheless, there is a superior law, and that is Ishvara, who has the capability. Because Ishvara is not bound, Ishvara in us can manage our karma, can manage our situation. And that's represented here. And in fact, in the Yoga Sutras, it says, Ishvara is a purusha vishesha, unaffected by klishas, karmas, vikapa, vipaka, and bodies. So in other words, our Ishvara is unaffected, unbound by karma. And it's interesting that Ishvara literally means number 11, which represents that in the Torah. How divinity 
manages karma and is superior to karma. In that sense, they're able to work with the law. So this passage in the Yoga Sutras is really interesting. Ishvara is a purusha. That word purusha is also very complex and is used in very subtle ways in the different philosophies of India. In this context, it, it most specifically translates as particular consciousness. Some translate it as master or being or God. But specifically, we need to understand that this is not God in that sense of some figure up in the clouds in heaven. It's different. And I put it this way because even when you look at this tarot card, you might think that that being is a figure, literally. And you might even see that figure in your experiences, in dreams or in meditation. And you might misinterpret that figure as being a literal being, but it isn't like that. Ishvara takes forms like the waves in the ocean in order to engage in activity, in order to manage the lion. But the Ishvara itself is unaffected by these factors. Klishas, which means afflictions. Karmas, which means actions. Vipaka, which means fruition of actions. And bodies. So this is really interesting to understand. When we want liberation, we have to reflect on why. Why do we want liberation? The obvious answer is because we suffer. But why do we suffer? We suffer because we are bound. We are caged, conditioned by all of these factors, by afflictions, by our previous actions and the fruit of those actions, and by bodies. Vehicles of different types. We ourselves love to think that we are quite spiritual and quite sophisticated. But the truth is, if we look at the facts, the hard and incontrovertible facts, none of us truly has power over bodies or liberation from bodies. We are trapped in these physical bodies, bound by them, conditioned by them. And there are many who claim to be masters Nevertheless, they are conditioned by the bodies they inhabit. Trapped. A true master is not conditioned by any body, any vehicle, but rather uses them as needed and discards them whenever he wants. In other words, a genuine master is not bound by physicality, energy, emotion, thought, will, consciousness, even spirit. Any of the seven bodies of the being that we typically talk about, the Ishvara is not bound by any of them, can use them, needs to use them, but it's not bound by them. We are. We are bound by this body. We are bound in our emotions. We are bound in our thoughts, the mental body. We are bound by the afflictions that we have, which are many, not just one. We can't even count them. Anger, frustration, fear, anxiety, resentment, lust. These afflictions that are always gnawing on us, chewing on us, pulling us one way and another. The Ishvara is not bound by any of that. So you see, that is inside of you. The Ishvara, your own Ishvara, your own being, is not bound by any of those things and, therefore, can help you. Because Ishvara has the capability to manage all of that to work with it, 
to liberate the individual soul, which is us. Because within that Ishvara, the pure consciousness, is the seed of Sarvanya. And it's there that it has its highest development. Now this passage is very interesting in the Yoga Sutras. Seed of Sarvanya. Sarvanya can mean Buddha, Arhat, omniscience. And if you reflect on that, it's sort of obvious that in the Ishvara, the being, would be the full and complete development of omniscience. But what is the seed of that? It is you. We are seeds, but not yet sprouted. We have in us the potentiality. We are part of that Ishvara, but latent, asleep. The seed needs to be nourished, cultivated, cared for, so that it can sprout and grow. And in that seed is the potential for the full development of the being itself. This is the nature of what we call self-knowledge. Self-realization. Now, I have not encountered this passage translated in the way that I'm going to point out to you now. But anyone who knows Gnosis probably already sees this. That this passage in Sanskrit that says, the Bijam Sarvanya, seed of Sarvanya, can be literally translated as Buddha seed, which in Sanskrit is Tathagata Garbha. Buddha nature, in other words, is what some people would say. So, looked at in that way, you can see that this is a Buddhist scripture. It's saying exactly the same thing that the Buddha Shakyamuni taught. Just with different perspective. There's no conflict between them. We are that Buddha nature. We have that. And it can be grown and fully developed. And that is what this passage is showing us. The full potential can only be fully realized through Ishvada. By that union with Ishvada. So the stutra continues, that pure consciousness, or Ishvada, being unconditioned by time, is even the teacher of the ancients. So this image on the right is just another variation on that tree of life. It's showing how the unmanifested manifests into different forms in order to teach and guide humanity. And this is what Krishna explains in the Bhagavad Gita. Krishna says, whenever the Dharma declines, whenever the spiritual teachings decline, I manifest myself in order to correct its course. But that Krishna is not outside of us. This is showing how Ishvara manifests in us to guide us. If we, if we learn how to listen and perceive that guidance. And this is the difficult part. To really come to recognize that guidance for what it is. What's important about this passage? It underscores really the fundamental um, presentation that we adopt in the Gnostic tradition. Which is that all religions... All mystical traditions are the same expression of the same thing. They're just variations with different colors and different terms. But they are all from Ishvara. This statement is saying that the Ishvara being unconditioned by time is the teacher of even the ancients. The same teacher of every religion, the same teacher of every scripture, the same teacher of every mystical form of teaching is Ishvara. What this points at 
is that we don't need to go to another country to find that. The Ishvara of Krishna taught what Krishna taught. The Ishvara of Buddha taught what Buddha taught. We have that same Ishvara in us. No difference. It's the same wave emerging out of an ocean. All we need is to learn to listen to it and not go running around from school to school and book to book and theory to theory looking outside. It isn't outside. It's inside. So, how do you do it? How do you actually do that? Well, this is why we're studying the steps of yoga. The previous lectures, we've discussed these first three steps, yama, niyama, and asana. Yama is self-restraint. Niyama is precepts or, or um, ethics. And asana is posture or relaxation. And to remind you, we explained in the previous lectures that if you can perfect these three, the rest of it is easy. These three are the hardest. Without any exception to that. They are the hardest part of yoga. Most people think because they're the first three, they must be the easiest and we should just skip right past them. But it's not like that. They're the hardest. They are, in other words, to be ethical and to be relaxed. And from that, then we can learn to harness the life force that we have within us. What is that life force? It is Ishvara. Remember that term Ishvara translated literally is creative source. Stated simply, our sexual energy is the very energy of Ishvara in us. By harnessing that energy, not abusing it, not wasting it, we work with Ishvara directly. But that's only effective if we're also accomplishing these first three steps of yoga. Having strong ethics and working constantly to improve them. And being relaxed. Tension destroys energy, wastes it. Relaxation is absolutely critical for the rest of the steps of yoga. There's no getting around that. About that, asana is usually interpreted as those postures of hatha yoga that people do. And in the context of raja yoga, it's, it's interpreted to mean how you sit for meditation. And it has that application. It's true. But how much of the day do you spend in meditation? Ten minutes? An hour? What about the rest of the time? How is your asana, your posture? When you're at your desk, when you're in your car, are you perfectly relaxed or are you tense, wasting energy through your movements? This is really the meaning. These steps of yoga are not just to be applied in the few moments before you sit to meditate and during your meditation session. They are to be applied at all times, even when your physical body is asleep, transforming the dream state as well. So these three cannot be overlooked if you really want to know what yoga is. Once these first four steps are harnessed, the rest become easy. Pratyahara, or suspension of senses, happens on its own automatically. Many attempt to force it. This is impossible. You know this for yourself because when you're very relaxed, you have a good asana, you lie down on the couch or on the bed and you're very relaxed, you're able to suspend your senses very easily and fall asleep. It's the same thing when you meditate. We learn to harness that, use that. And from that, we simply need to learn to concentrate. And from concentration, we enter real meditation until we finally access true samadhi or liberation, even if it's just for a brief instant. All of these eight stages 
work together. They feed and nourish each other. They can't be separated from each other. But most importantly, none of it will happen if we aren't working very closely with the first two, yama and niyama. Any serious spiritual person would be focused on those two above all things. And unfortunately, that we don't usually see that that is the case. Most people, when they come to spirituality, they just want to know, how do I go quickly to Pratyahara, to Dharana, Dhyana, Samadhi? How do I quickly reach Samadhi? And we get this question all the time as instructors. Students come in and say, I want to reach Samadhi right away. How do I do it? What's the fastest way to Samadhi? And it shows that they need to be more closely educated to understand that the way to it is to follow these stages. To really master, especially the first two. So that's why we're focusing on them so much in this course. And it says it in the Yoga Sutras. Success reaching Samadhi is quick for those who Vajraja is intense. Or by devotion and self-surrender to Ishvara. So previously we talked about Vajraja. This means non-attachment, vairagya. But non-attachment sounds like sort of a dry, scholarly sort of word. Really, vairagya means to be disenchanted with worldly things, with external things, to have realized that happiness cannot be found in possessions or jobs or houses, or cities, or places where we live, or who we know, that we cannot find real contentment in any of those things. When someone really has comprehended the utter, the utter futility of the modern pursuits of happiness, they are starting to find vairagya. Someone who has understood that there's really no point in chasing after what society is chasing, that person's starting to have this natural renunciation of those things. The craving for them goes away. Someone who has that very intensely, who's realized that their clothes don't really matter, their house doesn't really matter, as long as they have a safe place to live and they can eat and they can cover their bases, what more do they need? But instead they have... An a longing, an urgency to understand what God is, what spirituality is. That intense quality can produce quick access to samadhi, easily, because they're not distracted by anything outside. It's obvious. This is logic, simple. Someone who's constantly chasing after girls or boys does not have this quality. Someone who's so absorbed in the need to get married or have a boyfriend or girlfriend or the urgency to have a certain amount of money or to have fame or success of some kind. This type of person does not have vairagya. They might talk about not being interested in things, but the proof is in their actions, is in the quality of their mind. Vairagya is a kind of serenity, a kind of disconnection from societal demands. And if someone has that very intensely, samadhi happens easily because their energy is not being wasted outside. Most of us don't have that. Most of us have intense passions, desires, longings, and cravings. We have sexual desires and longings and cravings. We have Financial ones, we have family and society cravings and longings, very intense needs and wants. And those qualities that afflict us are extremely difficult to work on. But we're not without hope. If it's too difficult for someone to deal with all those passions directly, too intense 
then there's this alternate way that one can access samadhi, and that is to cultivate a lot of devotion towards the Ishvara. It is to look at all those cravings and desires and longings and to turn from them and say, my inner being, I put all of these into your hands. I want this and I want that and I want this other thing and I have all these things that are driving me crazy that I want so much and I am going nuts. But I put them into your hands. This is what Jesus was praying in the Gospels. When he said, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In that prayer is this devotion and self-surrender. In other words, if we don't have that non-attachment in ourselves already, then let's cultivate that devotion to our innermost. That is what we call bhakti. Bhakti is devotion, zeal, faithfulness, trust, faith, love. Most religious people have some amount of bhakti, devotion. Otherwise, they wouldn't be religious. It may not be much. They may just be going to church or temple out of habit. But there's enough sense in them of the, of the reality of divinity that that flame is still somewhat there, even if it's very small. But most of us have not really experienced what full and true bhakti is. When that fire in the heart consumes us. If you want to read and study the writings of someone who experienced that in a very beautiful way, read Rumi, the Sufi poet. The poems of Rumi are a beautiful illustration of bhakti. In his unbearable devotion for his Ishvara is very inspiring and will stoke that flame in you in the same way that when you pass your candle to someone and they can light their own any real master can do that they can hand you their candle and light your heart that's why we insist on studying scriptures and the writings of the real masters we need that fire in our heart. It is a devotion to the Ishvara inside of us. It feels intense and even painful, but beautiful. Another great example of a great bhakti yogi is Jean d'Arc, Joan of Arc. who also was consumed with this sort of devotion. And many other saints that we can name a long list of them. Francis of Assisi is another. Very beautiful devotion. In modern times, there are many traditions that strongly encourage this devotional aspect of the spiritual teachings. And uh, so in the West, for example, we have what are called the modern Pentecostal movements, where people are encouraged to cry out and pray and express emotion very uh, exuberantly in church. And they become quite emotional. And we find the same in many traditions. In Hinduism, for example, there are quite a few uh, schools and traditions that strongly emphasize this bhakti approach to yoga. And they sing songs and they do all night prayers and very intense sorts of rituals in order to stimulate the heart. And this is all wonderful. But unfortunately, most of the people that follow those types of traditions don't follow the steps of yoga. So they may be very devotional, but they do not have ethics, right conduct. And that's why we put this quote here from Swami Shivananda, who says that no development of bhakti is possible without sadachara, which is right conduct, ethics. 
So we may feel intense love for Jesus. But if we are a fornicator, a liar, an adulterer, we do not have real bhakti. And we meet many people like that who really seem to love God, but yet they lie for a living. They steal for a living. There are many people like that. We need to correct that in ourselves. We need to be a true bhakti has very strong ethics. Yama and niyama. Why is that? These stages of yama and niyama are so important. That's why in every lecture I'm bringing it up. This is our daily reflection. It should be on these qualities in ourselves and improving them. The first and the one that sets the tone and starts the whole uh, movement of developing ethics is to be compassionate. To be a loving, kind person. To have ahimsa. To not harm anyone in any way. And this doesn't mean just in our outward expressions, but also in our own mind. When we're driving our car and someone does something stupid and we feel all the profanity emerging in our minds, we have to change that. We have to convert that into patience and understanding and to understand that other people are suffering and they act poorly. We shouldn't lower ourselves to that level. We have to rise above in every case, every situation to transform it and become better. That is ahimsa. So that not only in our outward actions, but in our very thoughts, we are always expressing love to others. Why is that important? If we want union with Ishvara, we have to be like Ishvara. We have to become like Ishvara. And the Ishvara, the being, does not hate, does not harm, is not cruel, does not curse or blame. But Ishvara is an expression of love. So to unite with that, to have yoga with that in us, we need to become that way. It's simple. We need satyam to be truthful in everything, at all times, without exception, with ourselves and with others, to be truthful to not lie, to have asteya, which means to not steal. And of course, brahmacharya. Many traditions of yoga study these, these precepts in detail and they explain them in beautiful ways. But the one that's most often skipped or avoided is brahmacharya. We have met many devotees of many traditions who love God, who love religion, but they always give themselves this exception. They say, I'll do all of this except brahmacharya. They always give themselves that, that they think they can get away with this modification in their practice. And it's really sad because they can't. Without brahmacharya, there can be nothing else. If you don't have brahmacharya, chastity, sexual purity, you will never have yoga. It's simply impossible. When you are practicing brahmacharya, you are respecting Ishvara because Ishvara is that sexual power. Remember, Ishvara literally means creative power creative potential, capability. And what is the most powerful creative force we have? It is the ability to create life through sex. That power is the power of God in us. It isn't a plaything. It isn't a toy. 
But of course, as you know, our society has converted sexuality into a sport, into entertainment, and into a way to simply indulge in sensations at our leisure. And we are completely ignorant of the effects that has on us, especially spiritually. A real yogi, a real yogini, is made so by their brahmacharya, not by anything else. If one does not have sexual purity, chastity, one does not have anything. It is the seed of the Buddha itself. It is the brahmacharya. Now, of course, this word brahmacharya has different meanings in Hinduism. So to be explicit, when we talk about brahmacharya, we're talking about its base meaning, which is simple, to not have the orgasm, to not waste the sexual energy through lust. That means that one may be having the sexual act or not. That part is dependent on the circumstances of the person. The critical part is the restraint of that energy, the respect of it, the cultivation of it, the offering of that energy back to God so that God can use it for the upright purpose, which is to create and elaborate the soul, to perfect the soul. So the subject of brahmacharya is huge, and that's why we have so many books and lectures about it. We won't spend more time on that today. The next is a parigraha, which is renunciation, and it's related to that dispassion that we discussed, vairagya. Ultimately, what it means is that we have to become aware of our desires and work on them, not be manipulated by them, see them for what they are, really analyze them and understand them. Why do I want this thing so bad? Why is this thing calling my attention all the time? This person, this object, this situation that I'm always craving. If I get it, what will happen? If I don't get it, what will happen? We go through this sort of analysis to understand it. And we compare. Well, last year I went through the same feeling. I had this intense desire and I wanted this thing. And then I suffered and suffered for months. Finally, I got it. And then I still wasn't happy. (laughs) Isn't this the case? We have to apply that type of analytic approach in order to understand that these desires that afflict us are illusions. Comprehending that, we naturally develop the sense of renunciation. In Niyama, we have saucha, which is purity, cleanliness, not just externally, but mentally and emotionally. Santosha, which is to be content with what we have, to be satisfied and be joyful. Tapas, This is to accept our difficulties without complaining. You see, in every one of these steps, when you you really look at them, Svadhyaya is to study the religious books and work with mantras. The final one is Ishvara Pranidhana, which is to remember the self, to remember our Ishvara. When you look at all of these steps, they are all that. All of them. All of these aspects of yama and niyama boil down to this. Self-remembering. Awareness of Ishvara. To be aware of the presence of divinity within. At all times. When you have that, it's much easier to have renunciation when you are aware that your being is with you and is completely aware of everything that you're thinking and feeling and doing, it's much easier to realize, oh, well, here comes this desire, but my being is here too. So I can't indulge in that desire because my being is watching me. My Ishvara is here. How can I possibly entertain that thought? But we don't think that way, do we? That desire emerges and we just get caught up in the desire and we think that way and we think about it and think about it and we have the feelings about it and we may even act on that desire. And every once in a while we may get a little tug in our heart. What about religion? What about God? What about yoga? What about your practice? Aren't you spiritual? 
But the desire is so strong, we, no, 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 no. I need this. I want this. But if you're really remembering your Ishvara, really cognizant of the moment, really present, and aware that your being is inside of you right now, then when those desires emerge to tempt you, it's much easier to say, I don't need that. Why would I need to fulfill that desire when I have my being already? When I can feel the presence of my Divine Mother? When I know that my Ishvara is that heart flame that I feel, that heat, why should I become angry with this person? Why should I become resentful? Why should I gossip? Why should I say these harmful things that are only going to hurt others? I can restrain my tongue instead and be serene, be kind. That presence of Ishvara empowers all of this. So you see, when you look at these factors from that perspective, they don't seem that hard. Isn't it true? You know, when you first look at all these ethics, you start to feel overwhelmed, like, I can't possibly do these things. It's too much. But then when you reflect on it, well, if I'm remembering my being, these are easy. They're not hard. If I remember. <laughs> <laughs> That's the hard part, to remember. Fortunately, the Yoga Sutras gives us some help. The sacred word that designates your Ishvara is Om. Everyone knows the mantra Om. It's in every religion. It's in every tradition, just in different forms. Amen is Om. It's the same thing. This symbol on the right is that character written in Sanskrit. It's very beautiful. And all the people who practice yoga get tattoos of that symbol. I don't know why. And they have it on their cars. And I'm not sure that they really know what it means. Maybe they do. We're going to talk about it. Om represents Ishvara. We've heard many interpretations of Om. People have been talking about it in the West for a long time, and in India for much longer. And there are a lot of theories and discussions and debates and philosophies and whole books written about it. And you can go to conferences and spend thousands of dollars to learn about Om but it isn't complicated. Om is the name of your being. Om is sort of like when you're a child and you say, Mom, Dad, Om. You're calling your being. That's all it is. It's simple. It's much more than that too. But it's most immediate and important aspect is that. It has a lot of significance, philosophically, spiritually. We can go on and on about Om and all the symbols and what it means and how it relates to scriptures and time and the tree of life and different levels of God and all of that, but so what? What we need is to understand how it can transform our situation, transform our lives. Yoga Sutras explain it says, its repetition and its meditation with meaning should be practiced. Thence comes the cognition of the individual consciousness and also removal of obstacles. So let's talk about this short passage. Its repetition and its meaning, or its repetition and its meditation with meaning should be practiced. In Sanskrit, this is tat japa tat artha bhavanam. It's beautiful in Sanskrit. It expresses more than you can say in English. And I'm no Sanskrit scholar. But what I want to point out is this word japa, japa, tat japa. That word is so interesting. So we're going to talk about that in a moment. Here it's translated simply as repetition. And its meditation is bhavanam. Now, 
I've talked a lot about bhava in recent lectures. And this word is super important in Hinduism and Buddhism. And it's interesting that it's used here. The word bhava means being. Beingness. Becoming. The potential to become means a state or the current state, the way something is. But it's translated as meditation. And that's a very compelling translation. It tells us that meditation is not a posture. It is not a mantra. It is a state of being. A state of perception. So, this passage is pointing out to us how to use OM. It is stating that with meditation with meaning, a state of being with comprehension, with cognizance, with understanding, brings the cognition of the individual consciousness. That word cognition is a little bit weird in English. I think some people may not fully get what that means. It means comprehension, understanding. It means the functioning, the awakening. It's where the individual consciousness becomes, perceives, awakens, it works, it sees, it understands. So in synthesis, this passage is stating, if we learn to use OM consciously, it can awaken the consciousness and remove obstacles to the consciousness. Isn't that what we want as spiritual people? We want to awaken, we want to see the reality, and we want the obstacles moved out of the way so we can experience union yoga. Om provides a way to do that. So this is what's explained in the scripture in simple words. So that word japa literally means muttering. But it's used in Hinduism to describe the use of any mantra. Japa yoga is the yoga of using mantras. But there are three ways that one learns to use a mantra. To repeat these prayers or sounds. They're quite simple. Aloud, quietly, or silently. Vaikati japa is loud, verbal. Upamshu japa is whispered or hummed. Manasika japa is mental, silent, and still. So generally, when someone enters into a yoga tradition or any type of religion, they learn prayers. And usually you learn to say your prayers aloud to help you remember them, to help you learn them, and to stimulate you, but also so that you don't become distracted. When you say something aloud, you tend to be more aware of what you're doing. It takes more concentration to do that quietly and even more concentration to repeat the prayer silently. So when we were children, we all learned this way. We started learning to recite the letters of the alphabet and to recite the words of our language until little by little, we started to learn to read the books, but we started learning the reading the books aloud. We'd read page after page. Jack and Jill went up the hill. That's how children read. Later, they start to learn it quietly and then mentally. It's the same with mantras. The same process. Our attention, our concentration is weak. But we need to strengthen it to advance through the stages of yoga. So working with mantras is a very powerful way to do that. So this technique of using OM unites all of the factors of the stages of yoga, brings them together. If you, learn, if you know how to do it, it's a very effective way to meditate. And that's why we teach always in retreats and classes how to work with mantras, how to meditate and work with mantras, because they have a great power. But it should be understood that there are stages to that work. 
Shivananda explained that the fruits of whispered japa are a thousand times more powerful than the verbal japa. And the fruits of the silent mental japa are hundreds of thousands of times more powerful than the verbal one. Mental japa can even be kept up while at work. We've explained this on retreats. Vocalizing mantras aloud is wonderful. It's powerful, it's effective. But it is not as powerful as doing mantras quietly. That takes more concentration. It also allows the consciousness to start to sink deeper within and leave the physical world behind. And the mental work with mantras is 100,000 times more powerful, according to Shivananda. Precisely for that reason. When you're working mentally, you're capable in the point where you can completely abandon physicality, not be distracted by anything external, and even leave the body. And this is what we want. We want liberation. We want to be free of our afflictions. So working with Om or any mantra can give us that ability. This picture is of a mala, rosary in other words, beads used to count how many times one has worked with a mantra. Sadly, nowadays, it's just a fashion accessory. But the real use of a mala, these types of beads or a rosary, is that one counts each time one does the mantra. And a traditional uh, practitioner would never show these beads to anyone. They wouldn't wear them outwardly on their clothes or on their wrist or, you know, or wear a bunch of them because they only need one to do their practice. <laughs> but you see people now that wear you know, a whole lot of different rosary beads, and that's fine. But the real use, traditionally in yoga, they would even keep their beads in a bag and never take it out. And they'd put their hand inside the bag in order to do their mantra work. The beads would never come out of the bag, never be shown to anyone. Out of respect. It's just a traditional approach. I'm not saying any of you should do that. I'm just pointing it out. So, in synthesis, the practice that accompanies this lecture is to work on inflaming your heart, to work with this mantra Om. What that means is that we should be working to really remember our Ishvara from moment to moment, all the time, without any pause, without any break. And while doing that, to chant that mantra Om. It can be aloud, it can be as a whisper, or it can be mentally silent, depending on our own level of concentration and how well we're able to remember it. But if you're able to really be serious, you'll discover many new things about yourself and about your being. If you carry with you psychologically, consciously, the mantra Om at all times, now, specifically, I would say that if you also do it in conjunction with the use of the spiritual diary that we recommended, you'll learn even more. This practice can reveal a lot about your practice and what you need to work on to improve. And the second part here is to dedicate time every day to actually meditate with that sound, to stop what you're doing, to take a very comfortable position, close your eyes, and disassociate your senses from everything external and chant that mantra. If you do it aloud, it's fine. If you do it as a whisper, that's fine too. If you do it mentally, that's also good. But to do that for the period of time that you're able to do it, 10 minutes, half an hour, an hour, whatever that is, during that time, to dive into that sound, to learn about it and to inflame your heart with it. All of that will empower your spiritual practice in a very dramatic way, if you're serious. And to sum all of that up, I give you this quote that I love from Samael Anvior, who says, the Gnostic places all of his longings in the hands of his innermost. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, 
we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Thank you.